Hey, so here we are in a Mormon Truth video. I'm mad as heck, and I'm not going to take it anymore. From Latter Day Saints subreddit mods. Well, had a lovely experience here. Actually, that's a bit of a euphemism. Educational, maybe I should say, into the level of uh, information control and uh, censorship that's going on in Latter-day Saints subreddit. And it appears to me that it's just an extension of what we get in certain high control organizations that use the bite model. Behavioral control, information control, thought control, and emotional control. So I've done a couple of videos previously regarding coercive persuasion techniques and various uh, religious organizations such as Jehovah's Witnesses and I always seem to find some similarities in the LDS church ironically so I want to do a quick look at something I found in the seminary manual yeah this has been in a couple of my videos so I'm just going to be real quick about it and then we're going to take a closer look at some of the things we see with Jehovah's Witnesses and particularly at a couple excerpts I've got from a nice video presentation done by Chris Johnson, who's got his own YouTube t channel called Ask Reality, where you're, probably you should go if, you, if you're interested in this information because he did a really nice segment there um, concerning his journey within the church and noticing things that the Jehovah's Witnesses, Scientologists, you know, Moonies, but especially the JWs were dealing with their people and then noticing it in the one true church. Of course, the JWs think they have the one true church, and that's what the other guys do too. They all have their special leaders that are the people that, you know, talk to God and with God and then relay the messages to the people. In uh, maybe uh, psychology or uh, studies of. Uh, high control, coercive persuasion, cult mind control. This is called a messiah complex. And we've got it on Reddit. Quickly, I'll take the other reference, and then I'm going to go and show what these guys have to say, and then maybe get a little bit about what they did, and how they banned me. When I, according to me, was keeping the rules, but they had a guy attack what I had to say, although I was carefully trying to abide their rules, and he clearly violated them. But they got rid of me because I shared scriptures from the Book of Mormon and from the Book of Moses and from the Doctrine and Covenants. Yeah, I said, just read the whole chapter without, you know, without parsing it with a uh, correlated lesson to guide you. Just read the whole article and discuss it in Elders Quorum, which is what I said to a guy who uh, on Latter-day Saints subreddit said he was about to give his first Elder Scorum lesson, didn't have a lesson prepared, wondered what he should do. He was afraid that other people might, you know, be too non-participatory, and he'd be giving a uh, dissertation in a quiet room and feeling on the spot, and he's already got anxiety issues. So I gave him some hints, since I've taught a lot of Elder Scorum and a lot of Sunday school and that sort of a thing, and uh, suggested, why not just read straight out of these lovely chapters with stories like the, uh, you know, Brother Jared seeing Jesus story, or Enoch face-to-face -face with Jesus story, that sort of a thing, and then discuss interesting aspects of these, which I sort of mentioned, and I was attacked for it. Why? Well, maybe because he told the Brother of Jared he was the first guy to ever see him, or have enough faith to see him, and that was like a thousand years after Enoch had a uh, similar experience. Oops. Yeah, anyway... A little clip out of uh, Chris Johnson's um, Ask Reality channel video here on his journey in Mormonism and when he began investigating certain aspects of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, better known as the, the Jehovah's Witnesses, an organization that uses a great deal of coercive persuasion, otherwise known as mind control. And if you want to see group mind control in cult mind control, uh, you know, in action, in 
called Mind Control Mode, we can look at organizations like the Moonies, Scientology, and the Jehovah's Witnesses. And then we can see how familiar any of these tactics are. I always thought that my mind control was something from the movies. So when the ex Jehovah's Witnesses began explaining how their minds had been manipulated and controlled by specific techniques, I was in shock and amazement. Slowly, it all started to make sense. This is how they do it. Here is an official Jehovah's Witness video made to teach gospel principles to their children. I don't want Jehovah to be sad with me. No, I don't want Jehovah to be sad with you either. So what do you think you should do with this toy? I think most of us could see that the parent used fear to manipulate young Caleb. However, when I spoke with former Jehovah's Witnesses, they pointed out many other factors that I was not aware of. They described various techniques that were well established in psychology by prominent researchers such as Leon Fessinger of MIT and Robert J. Lifton of Harvard University. Steve Hassan, one of America's most prominent mind control experts, condensed these techniques into what he calls the bite model. In his book, Releasing the Bonds, he shows how certain political, religious, and commercial groups use the bite model to control the minds of their members. can be systematically broken down, indoctrinated through controlling information, controlling their behavior, controlling their thoughts, controlling their emotions, and made into obedient, dependent slaves. This is how the bite model of mind control works. To control someone's behavior, all you need to do is control their thoughts and emotions. To control someone's thoughts, you need to affect their emotions and behavior. To control someone's emotions, you need to control their behavior and thoughts. Thoughts and emotions can be controlled by controlling the information made available to the mind. This is how it works, step by step, piece by piece. This is what Jehovah wants you to do. That's why you should always listen to mom and daddy. While it may seem irrational to demonize magical toys, or prevent members from voting, or prevent children from receiving proper blood transfusions, these arbitrary rules, along with many others, serve an important role for the witnesses. Not only do they enforce behaviors that strengthen their belief in the Watchtower organization, but they also cause enough societal differences and tension to separate the members from the world and increase reliance on the group. This leads to information control. They will often label outsiders as evil or worldly, which creates further distrust and separation from the outsiders. The more the organization teaches the witnesses to distrust outside sources of information and rely on internal sources, the more they are able to control the information entering the minds of the members. and those who are in the organization, the better the chance that nobody within will learn the truth. We apostates are dangerous to them because we see through all of this manipulation. They control the information. They bombard you with literature, with meeting attendance, assemblies, um, etc. and words. So a powerful way to control someone's thoughts is by redefining the meaning of their words. Initially, new members are often concerned that they cannot understand all the words used at the Kingdom Hall. For example, the Jehovah's Witnesses have redefined the truth to mean the 
Watchtower organization. While it looks harmless on the surface, altering the meaning of words can overflow into other areas of life, controlling a vast array of thoughts. For example, if a Jehovah's Witness thinks the Watchtower organization is not true, he may feel confused without knowing why. This happens because his thoughts are actually saying the truth is not true. The effect is heightened by the fact that there are literally hundreds of redefined words in the Jehovah's Witness vocabulary. All of these words gain more power through repetition in Kingdom Hall meetings, prayers, conventions, magazines, handouts, lectures, books, and social activities with other members. The cumulative effect distorts the natural thinking process, adds bias, and makes it more difficult to leave or think critically of the Watchtower organization. As this information began to sink in, I asked myself a difficult question. If I had been raised in the Jehovah's Witness religion, would I be emotionally strong enough to resist their style of indoctrination and mind control? How would I find the truth? One logical way to find out if the group is legitimate is to use independent thinking skills and critically question everything its current and past leaders taught. But they had this covered too. Jehovah's Witnesses are not allowed to critically question the leaders, nor are they allowed to think independently. Another important aspect of mind control is controlling the emotions. This can be done by instilling phobias, such as a fear of losing family or a fear of apostates. Well, we never looked at any apostate information for a long time because that is like a huge no-no. And YouTube's full of quote-unquote apostate videos. And I was so afraid of them, like, whoa, this is so bad. But when you think about it, if it's the truth, then that's not going to matter, you know? But we, I was afraid. I was afraid that the, the devil was controlling them, and, and that's how they have this bad information that will get you. Listen to how the Jehovah's Witness leaders instill phobias towards people who have left their organization, some of which may have joined the Latter-day Saints. This is from their 2013 district convention. Like Satan, human apostates are unruly men who cook up wicked reasonings and season their brew with poisonous lies that deceive minds. Apostates are mentally diseased, and they try to infect others with their disloyal teaching. So avoiding apostates means that we will not allow them into our homes by reading their literature, watching TV programs that feature them, examining their websites, or adding our comments to their blogs. Apostates are not sincere in their expressions. Their aim is to manipulate your minds and undermine your faith. They are liars and deceivers bent on destroying your relationship with Jehovah God and His Son, Christ Jesus. My son, when we tell you to do something, it's because we love you. We want the best for you. Another powerful emotion is love. If an organization can exploit the love we have for those dearest to our hearts, they can manipulate us into compliance. What this shutting does is causes the members to now accept any tenant that the Watchtower Society mandates without question. Why? Because they'll lose their family and friends. That's how mind control works. When all these techniques are used together, the end result is that mind becomes obedient to group authority and becomes less able to think rationally or act independently. After learning about these techniques from the Jehovah's Witnesses, I noticed a slight shift in my awareness. I no longer felt any fear towards reading apostate literature. Such fear would only be necessary if I were in a false organization that was trying to plant phobias to prevent me from learning the truth. If I were in the true church, there was nothing to fear, nothing to hide. I will put the knowledge of mind control in the opposing model because it is an essential part of avoiding deception and a prerequisite for finding the truth. But little did I know that liberating knowledge would soon change the course of my life forever. Let's go take a look at the seminary manual real quick and see what uh, President Monson and Dallin have to say. See how close that is to what the... Like Satan, human apostates are unruly men who cook up wicked reasonings and season their brew with poisonous lies that deceive minds. Apostates are mentally diseased, and they try to infect others with their disloyal teaching. So avoiding apostates means that we will not allow them into our homes by reading their literature, watching TV programs that feature them, examining their websites, or adding our comments to their blogs. Apostates are not sincere in their expressions. 
All right. Uh, print's kind of small here, so uh, this isn't seminary teacher's manual, so it's telling the se seminary teachers to uh, to inoculate the children, basically, against those who might be, you know, wolves in sheep's clothing, essentially. So what does it say here? It says, there have always been a few who want to discredit the church and to destroy faith. Today, they use the internet. Pardon my dramatization there, but, you know, when we listen to these guys talk, it, it gets pretty interesting. Maybe I'm accentuating a little bit. Some of the information about the church, no matter how convincing, is just not true. This is quoted from Trial of Your Faith, Ensign or Leahona, November of 2012. Just above that, they had Thomas Monson, so I think that might, might be him. Interesting. So no matter how much sense it makes... It isn't true. Listen to your leaders. Ignore it. Well, here we've got Dallin A. Chokes. And listen to what he says. And they, they told the teachers to, you know, share this with the class and maybe even give them a handout on it. It says, invite the students to read <clears throat> aloud the following statement by Elder Dallin A. Chokes. So the Quorum of the Twelve. We always need to use titles like Elder or President and that sort of a thing because it gives authority. And it gives authority and that's important when we're using course of persuasion okay invite the class to listen for how we should how we should evaluate what we read about the church and its history hmm. oh, okay is this called information control and thought control you may want to provide a copy of the statement for each student <clears throat> so they can follow along. So this is important. Okay, says Dallin, Latter-day Saint readers should dot, 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 be dot, 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 sophisticated in their evaluation of what they read. Okay, so we need to be smarter than those wolves in sheep clothing that we use sophisticated means to deceive us is kind of the message I think I'm getting out of that. What are you getting? Says Dallin, our individual personal testimonies are based on the witness of the Spirit, not on any combination or accumulation of historical facts. With our own dot, dot, dots, I say, Dallin says, our individual personal testimonies are based on the witness of the Spirit, not on facts. Not on historical facts. Ignore the facts. If it feels good, do it. Ooh, I saw that on bumper stickers, and I'm pretty sure that was about something immoral long, long ago. Okay, but if it's the church, that's different, right? Dallin continues and ties this in with our worthiness, our ability to be cognizant, to, to, to have exercise cognitive dissonance. I don't know, in other words, our ability to exercise faith in things not logical is dependent upon our worthiness. Now, let's see what he ha has, else has to say here. Our individual personal testimonies. Okay, I read that. All right. Our Heavenly Father gave us powers of reason. Okay, now he's going to do a, a flip-flop. He's going to do a turnaround maneuver on us. Okay, these are good. Hinkley was really good at this. Heavenly Father gave us powers of reason, and we are expected to use them to the fullest. Now he'll turn it around and say, unless of course it, got, it unless of course it, it doesn't go along with what I'm telling you, okay? Uh, and says Dallin, but he also gave us the Comforter, who he said would lead us into truth and by whose power we may know the truth of all things. Wow, so there's a turnaround. Distrust logical reasoning and facts if we feel differently. That is the ultimate guide. That is the ultimate guide, Latter-day Saints who are worthy and willing to rely on it. That's what you use if you're 
It's the ultimate guide for truth. If we're worthy and willing. Worthy and willing. Worthy and faithful. If you are worthy and exercise faith in Jesus Christ, you will ignore the facts and rely on your testimony, and your testimony is a witness of the Spirit that tells you that whatever Dallin and Thomas Monson and Dieter tell you is true. Yeah. And if you don't get the witness, it's because you're not worthy. If you don't rely on the witness, you must not be worthy. Do we see how this circular reasoning works? This is mind control. You can rationalize it because it's LDS, or you can look at the same thing being used in other organizations, like the Jehovah's Witnesses. So I'll interject a few things from them. But at this point, I'm going to break from here. I'll see you in Reddit. Watch the similar reasoning that we find from the JWs, between our general authorities, and what we're seeing on the LDS subreddit. Evidently, someone is exercising control here, just like they do with uh, three Mormons through uh, more, more Good Foundation. So here we are, back on the subreddit. This is out. This is they're they're saying why you need that you need to listen to them to how to inter how to act on Reddit, how to interpret things, how to protect yourself from wolves in sheep's clothing, information control similar as we would see with Scientology, the Moonies, and the Jehovah's Witnesses. But here we have it here again. So let's let's read a little bit of this. Pardon me if I dramatize just a tad. Okay. Cool, I got it. Why do I need the survivor guide anyway? Confrontations? Now that you've <clears throat> set up your particular subreddits, blah, 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 you're going to have to face people that want to, what? Kill your testimony? There are wolves in sheep's clothing, a plenty here, and poison enough to kill any testimony. Really? Now, if your testimony is based on truth and you have factual evidence that seems to substantiate it, then shouldn't truth be able to stand up in the light? Most of us can deal easily with those who mock us or who are overt in their antagonism. But the tricky thing is to be able to identify those who pretend the role of a candid friend. But he has a secret desire to hurt, not merely to help. So they say, in other words, they learn and know a lot about the church, but they only learn about the church so they can get people out of it. They pretend to be members or friends so they can get your trust. They have heard of the kindly light. Sounds Masonic. But have fallen away by focusing only on the encircling gloom. You notice my voice, you might actually hear this kind of thing, maybe a little less uh, obvious in a Jehovah's Witness uh, uh, sermon, or should I try to make it sound a little bit more like Thomas Monson, who uses hypnotic cadence in his language and knows very well what he's doing, like Gordon and, and uh, Dieter, I think they're all pretty adept at neuro-linguistic programming, hypnotic language, and pulling switches like we saw previously, and I also illustrated Gordon B. Hinckley doing that. Those people honestly believe they are doing something good, even in the midst of their deceptions. Notice the language that's used. They feel that the faithful are deluded, and any action done to free us is a worthwhile one. They will say things like, oh, I have been there before, and I'm not trying to pick a fight. They want to seem as innocent as doves. They wear the clothes of intellectualism to disguise their cynicism. They use kind words to mask their pessimism. They act like faithful friends, but all they want is to sow doubt. The longer you stay on Reddit, the more you will notice these people. 
and their abusive little comments. They begin with something innocent seeming enough like, how can you tell the difference between the Holy Ghost and your own feelings? Or do I know or do I believe I know? But then they will try to create doubt with every response. They'll spend hours researching and finding sources to back up their arguments against any stance which promotes faith. Faith, of course, is good, right? They want to cheapen your spiritual experiences. How, where have I heard that word? Cheapen? Is that what we associate with someone who has not kept themselves pure for their marriage? So that's a that's a trigger word, okay? In 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 the minds of LDS people, cheapen. We know what that means. It means you've been immoral, and not kept yourself pure. And so the associations that are being used here are very clever. The person writing this knows what they're doing as far as psychological manipulation techniques go. They want to cheapen your spiritual experiences just as somebody cheapened theirs. Oh, they want to drag you down and make you miserable like unto Satan. Right? We've all, are we recognizing patterns here? Their goal is simple. Make the mists of darkness seem even more inviting. Last I checked, the mists of darkness weren't supposed to be inviting. They were just supposed to make it difficult to see the iron rod. Okay, two perspectives. See, the detractors of the church have closed their spiritual eye. They have made the decision to only see the world in the temporal perspective. But you are spiritual and superior, right? So you can see through their BS. Can you see why that's a huge deal? It means that when you use words like, I know by the power of the Holy Ghost, what they hear is, I've deceived myself by the power of brainwashing. They use the word brainwashing because that's more of a trigger towards something that sounds, you know, a little bit far-fetched. So they're discrediting with underlying meanings in the language that they're using here. They cannot make room for the idea that there's anything to be gained by a spiritual perspective. For such a perspective would condemn their interpretations and lifestyles. It's funny how that works. Everyone tries to put a, you know, square peg into a round hole, or vice versa. In other words, we have to make reality conform to our belief system, whether we are LDS, Jehovah's Witness, or atheist, you know, or Christian, or whatever it may be. We, we make things conform to our lifestyle. People that have left the church, a lot of them, maybe 90% of them, decide there's no spiritual world because they've decided that atheism is what they're into, and so they, they may negate everything they ever felt that was spiritual and, and, and say it's all emotional. And a lot of it may have been. A lot of people don't have spiritual experiences and just interpret things that way. But funny how they, they let them all go when they make a determination that the world is a certain way, then everything must fit into that, whatever our belief system is. So I mentioned that. Okay, so we're going on. They say, this also means they will appeal entirely to your temporal eye and try to get you to close your spiritual eye, to examine spiritual things in a purely temporal way. They want you to be shocked and outraged. They want you to think the Lord's way is unfair. They want you to speak, excuse me, they want you to speak, argue, debate, and think only in terms of what can be understood by the world. All right, so we need to differentiate ourselves from these worldly people whose perspective would basically skew our spiritual sight and blind us to God's truths. See how they're weaving this in? I know you're probably thinking, but is it really all that bad? Consider this from Elder Bednar. I raise an apostolic voice of warning about the potentially stifling, suffocating, suppressing, and constraining impact of some kinds of cyberspace interactions and experiences upon our souls. Isn't that interesting? Just like the Jehovah's Witnesses who said that people wanted to, that apostates wanted to manipulate your mind, they were describing their own tactics. And here, 
suffocating and suppressing is exactly what this subreddit does. When their mods shut me down, when I was keeping the rules, I was very polite. I used the scriptures. I didn't jump in there like, you know, a Christian person does often on YouTube and say things like, Joseph Smith was a con man and a pervert and a pedophile and you worship another Jesus and Lucifer was his brother. You know? <laughs> no, I said, why don't you read the entire chapter, you know, Ether chapter 3, and then ask the brethren to notice and discuss things like Jesus saying he's both the Father and the Son, or Jesus asking that, um, you know, Brother Jared, if he saw more than his finger, which obviously an omniscient God wouldn't need to do, or Jesus mentioning that he, Brother Jared is the first guy to ever see him, and then reading, you know, Moses chapter 7 and D&C 107, verse 54, which both have the Lord visiting with people face to face or, you know, blessing Adam, you know, in front of everybody, now, anywhere between, say, 700 and 1100 years before this whole Brother Jared thing. In other words, leading them into a place where they can see that the scriptures contradict themselves and evidently Jesus has problems keeping his story straight when it comes to at least through Joseph Smith. But, I was careful in the way I said things, and yet, their guy, you know, trash talking me, calling me Mr. Fake News and saying I made things up, and I said, excuse me, um, I'll just paste it here off of, uh, you know, LDS.org, if you don't mind, and you tell me what I made up. Then he says, I'm parsing for errors. I said, no, I'm not saying there's an error, this is what it said. You're the one that, what? he goes, I, I said, I, I, I read it with faith. With faith what? With faith that Jesus said three days it took, you know, took to walk from Jerusalem to the Red Sea, or the borders by the Red Sea, but maybe he meant 30? No. I read it in plain English the way it says. After 3,900 different corrections have occurred since Jesus supposedly said it was true in D&C chapter 1, section 1. And you have faith that he's lying because it makes these other impossible stories more possible <laughs> yeah anyway so they banned me but this guy's calling me mr fake news and and telling me i need medication and i'm delusional i'm going excuse me all i did was take this off lds.org you know <laughs> it's called scripture and you're supposed to believe it and i suggested that they read the entire chapter instead of utilize a correlated lesson the cherry picks and avoids difficult subject matter. So why the Survivor's Guide? Because if you choose to stay and participate in Reddit, you will be challenged in subtle and cruel ways. It's cruel to share truth, isn't it? You must be prepared to be the saint who is able to acknowledge the mist of darkness. Does this sound culty to anybody besides me? The encircling gloom or the shafts in the whirlwind without abandoning the iron rod, the kindly light, the sure foundation. Think you can manage? Well, it's dangerous to go alone. Take this practical method, methodology. All right, and here's all the ways to avoid coming in contact with, you know, anything that might uh, <laughs> shake your faith. It is clear that evil communications are not just a matter of bad manners, but if practiced by those who are Latter-day Saints, they can adversely affect those who do have knowledge of God or a testimony of the Savior. All right, anyway. That's enough for them on that part. Okay, so just like the Jehovah's Witnesses say and tell their people to avoid apostates, their information, their websites, uh, their blogs, their television shows, whatever, you know, filter your information. And just like we saw with Dallin said and, and with... Uh, you know, the other quotes and so forth from the ensign. Here we've got, and, and we've got on LDS.org that tells us that God wants us to discern 
or that it's important to discern, you know, that all sources of information are, are not good and that there's all kinds of bad stuff on the internet. It's, that's on the Gospel Topic essays. So they filtered it for us and provided where it's one easy place to find and then, you know, never put anything on the uh, homepage you know, for the last four years because they wanted to see it, wanted us to see it, wanted us to see it so bad. I also show that in the seminary manual, uh, they ask the teacher to uh, prepare the students for the idea that they might find out that there's like nine versions of the first vision. But Joseph Smith, he was just, you know, adjusting the message for different crafts. They don't get into the part that he couldn't figure out how old he was, why he was there, or who came. You know, he just said he emphasized something different, and then made a false comparison to the Apostle Paul, who had uh, contradicted himself, absolutely, and said, you know, I saw a light, but I didn't hear a darn thing, or, yeah, I heard this voice, but I never saw anything in, in, in different... Uh, uh, places in the New Testament, and then they say, well, he's just emphasizing, you know, to his uh, different crowd what he's talking about. No, no, he didn't emphasize. He contradicted. Of course, they don't give the words of it because that might cause people to think. So anyway, um, just like that, we've got um, we've got these guys preparing our minds to avoid. Um, <laughs> avoid sources that might tempt us to believe something else. And, and what I was going to say there is really a weird. They said, in case you wanted to know about these uh, other versions of the first vision, you know, you know, if you're really into uh, learning, you know, church history, here's an article we got from 1985 that you could check out. There's no hyperlink, I don't think, on it. It's just like, it was printed, you know, check and go find it in the Ensign or somewhere in 1985. Gee. Why not check it out in the Gospel Topics essays? Because you might see there's just about eight other ones and about four of them are other really problematic issues. So we don't want the seminary students to see that, even though it said that we're really interested in making sure Latter-day Saints are well-informed on church history. Yeah, that's all in the uh, preamble or preface. Too. Just as you choose which subreddits you will visit and which voices you will give time with your brain, you also choose what you will believe. Believing in God, the spiritual, in God, the spiritual, in the LDS Church, is a decision you make. When you reach a moment of crisis, a moment when you aren't sure of an answer, or when you learn something which doesn't fit your world view, you make a decision. The decision is this, do I approach this with a spiritual perspective, a worldly perspective, or both. For example, a day will surely come when somebody will ask you, why would God do this? They don't want to bring up anything specific and get people to think about problematic issues, so they're trying to be ambiguous. Or if the church is true, then why did Joseph Smith do this? Like take other men's wives and break his marriage covenant? I thought covenants, you know, were supposed to be honored. But no, we're supposed to believe that God commanded him to break his marriage covenants, the terms upon which Emma married him. I harp on that a lot, because that's a God that doesn't seem to have a whole lot of integrity, even though he said in section 132, which Joseph never submitted to the church, that these, you know, contracts and obligations were actually in force until death. And offer a challenge for which you may not be fully prepared. When that day comes, you must understand that there are three ways to approach this question. This is called inoculating people, by the way. Training them in cognitive dissonance. To reject clear thinking. First, the closed-mindedness of the temporal perspective. That a doubter Let's give a negative label there and make them evil, right? A doubter sees questions as evidence that God doesn't exist or that the LDS church is false. A doubter sees an inability to provide instant answers as flaws and poses the question, why would God blah, 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 instant answers? So that implies that there is an answer. It's just that, you know, God's not that quick with your gift of the Holy Ghost because he wants to try your faith, right? Why would God, dot, 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 in a way meant to mean this proves there cannot be a God? In other words, if God acts in, uh, you know, opposition to his own declared character, there must be a problem. Guess what? Yeah, that's called logical thinking, thinking, isn't it? 
No, God can do anything you want. It's just a mystery, and we'll find out in the millennium. Just keep paying your tithing. Second, the closed-mindedness of faith. A person coming from a faithful perspective will sometimes act as if the alternative to faith simply doesn't exist. He dismisses the doubter as a liar and therefore chooses to ignore the question. Okay, that's a really smart one, too. They, they're, <clears throat> that way they actually appear to be objective by saying, well, you don't need to ignore the question like that. That would be closed-minded. No, we're going to find a way that we can live with the question, still basically ignore it, you know, as far as thinking goes, but it's just another psychological trick. They're using so many inoculating uh, techniques here. In fact, I saw on Reddit today somebody else posted something where some guy went, uh, well, he's supposed to be released you know, from his mission. Instead of the stake president dropping by, they said, saying, hi, for five minutes, you're released. No, it didn't go that way. He had like a 30 minute you know, session with the parents and even had them you know, arrange to uh, monitor his cell phone use. Uh, all sorts of behavioral and information control tactics to uh, merge him into uh, into the next phase of his life under the complete control of LDS Inc. Finally, there's the option to embrace your faith and your uncertainty at the same time. Oh, really? You can embrace faith and doubt at the same time? Because last time I checked, we were taught that those were opposites and could not exist in the same space. That's uh, emphatically declared in a particular book that they used to give the missionaries called, uh, what's it, Drawing on the Powers of Heaven. In a way to mean God exists, so let's find out why God does this. He or she is happy to say, I don't have an answer for this right now, but I think one exists. In other words, put it on the shelf, wait for the millennium, pray, pay, and obey. Let's examine every avenue in light of what we already know. For the faithful student, patience is truly a virtue, and he recognizes that while answers truly come, sometimes... They take a hell of a long time. Nephi? Did he say hell of a long time? Sorry. Embrace the ambiguity presented by the differing views of the temporal and the spiritual. We need to have both perspectives. We cling to the iron rod while acknowledging the mists of darkness. We follow the kindly light through the encircling gloom. Seen with both a spiritual eye and a temporal eye gives us the most realistic perspective of the world and makes us most likely to find truth. In other words, if it doesn't make any sense, just keep on believing. Keep on paying. Keep on praying. Like Thomas Monson said, the sure way to truth, brothers and sisters, is obedience, constant obedience. Yeah, he uses hypnotic voice cadence. That might not have sounded too hypnotic, but uh, his cadence and his message and the repetitions used are professional, not accidental. They know what they're doing. They want you to ignore the factual information, just be blind to it, or say, I can live with the fact that I can't answer these questions. I can live with the fact if I run into them. In the meantime, these people are saying, avoid any interaction that could bring you into questions that would cause you to realize that they are not reconcilable to a belief that an all-knowing, just, holy, and true, and truthful God is unchanging and is guiding the leaders of the church. That's the problem. So, step number one is avoid hearing it. But they know you're going to, so they're trying to inoculate you so that you just don't pay attention to it and say that those people have screwed up minds because they don't have the spiritual perspective. They've hardened their hearts, they're controlled by the devil, etc. Yeah. Anyway, that's what we saw on Reddit.
Mind control being used to the fullest. To try to keep us from using our rational thinking abilities. And they associate it with everything that's wrong. Just like the Book of Mormon does when it says everyone who doesn't believe must be evil, hard-hearted, wicked, filled with pride. The same kind of rhetoric we see throughout LDS scripture and the same thing we're seeing in these warnings about how evil those people are and what evil influences they are trying to steal your happiness and your faith when all they're doing is stealing back the tithing money from the church, which is actually not stealing. They just perceive it that way. They don't have a right to it, and they don't have a right to us. No, actually, they've been the dishonest ones, and they are the ones who are men of many words and speak much flattery into the people. Okay, then. Think about it. Share it. Comment on it. Watch it again. Yeah. And go to uh, Chris Johnson's uh, Ask Reality and, and, and watch his uh, observations of how the J-dubs do it. Did a great job. Well, amen then.